Okay, we're going to go ahead and start on time, even though I know that people are going to be uh, drifting in and out, um, uh, because we have a two-hour time slot and we have five presentations. So um, my name is Lisa Dugan, and I'll be moderating the panel. I'm going to introduce, the, the speakers are going to speak in the order that they're listed in the program, and I will introduce them each one just before he or she speaks, so that people who are panel hopping will know who they're, who they're seeing, who they're hearing. Um, so our first speaker is Yuen Mei Wong, um, who is undertaking doctoral research at the Department of Women's Studies in, at, at, college, at University of Maryland College Park. Her current research interests include the emerging network societies in Asia, in Asia digital technologies, and the social production of space. Also, the trans, transnational queer subject formations, Yuen Mei. Thank you, Dr. Lisa Dugan, for your introduction, and thank you to the organizer of the conference for having me here with you. So the title of my paper today is Queering the State question mark, the ban of sexuality merdeka in Malaysia. So this paper aims to examine the intersection of queer politics in Malaysia with the neoliberal sexual politics of the United States and its implications. Jaspia Poor argues in terrorist exemplages homo-nationalism in queer times that new homo-normativities are geopolitical negotiations of biopolitics. I assert here that the evolving politicization of non heteronormative gender identity in Malaysia is part of that geopolitical negotiation. Malaysia's geopolitical position has opened up the peninsula to transnational influence throughout the history. From a multi-kingdom, Hindu, and Buddhist society, the population of Peninsula Malaya converted to Islam during the Malacca Sultanate in the 1400s. Experienced colonization by the Portuguese and the Dutch in the 1500s, and finally found themselves at next as part of the British Empire in the early 1700s. Although Christian missionary work continued, the underlying religious culture of the Malays in Malaysia has remained Islam since the 15th century. So when Malaysia attained independence in 1957, a dual system of legislation and enforcement was established. Civil law under elected officials and Sharia law under Islamic authorities. Since independence, nationalism in Malaysia has had a specific cultural politics, and nation building is con consti uh, constitutionally a racialized, theocratic nationalist project. The 1957 federal constitution established the legal political status of the ethnic Malays and indigenous people under the term Bumiputra, son of the soil, and recognized Islam as the religion of the federation. In this way, the racialization of Islam and Islamization of national culture was established from inception by the Malaysian federal Consti constitution and later further consolidated in the 1971 national cultural policy, despite the assistance of non-Malay Muslim individuals and communities, as well as non-Muslim ethnic individuals and communities in the national territory. In its formation as a monarchical democracy, not only did the Peninsular Malay Muslim Sultanates constitute the foundation of its establishment, but also the faith of Islam became the legal qualification and identity of rulers of the state political system. This both rendered the state theocratic nature from its early formulation and intensified the institutionalization of Islamic authority in the state structure enabling the state to replace the family and the community as the socializer of individuals and the enforcer of social control in post-independence Malaysia. Religious and cultural practices and enterprises outside of the parameters of the constitution, for example, non-Muslim schools and churches or temples are subject to privatization and communal responsibility, whereas constitutionally endorsed practices and institutions are financially supported by the state. 
Freedom of religion and other cultural practices were defended under the non-discrimination principle subsumed under fundamental liberty in the Constitution and were later captured under the rubric of multinationalism in the 1980s. In the decade of the eight, late 80s, homosexual issues were brought into the public sphere, especially following the HIV AIDS epidemic, which significantly affected gay men in Malaysia. Pink Triangle was the first community-based organization set up in the capital city Kuala Lumpur in response to the epidemic. In the following decade, state criminalization of same-sex sexual behavior was preceded by the Muslim legal systems, amendment of the Sharia law and hudud. This timeline shows that institutional homophobia within the contemporary Muslim communities in Malaysia is indeed a recent historical phenomenon. Homophobia in Malaysia is deeply entangled with social processes of capital, capitalism and modernization, and with the rise of Islamic revivalism, or what is known widely in the West as neoliberal political terminology as Islamic fundamentalism. Such enactment of homophobic legislation not only overtly align a heterosexist Islamic legal structure with the existing heteronormative Sharia law, it also provided a basis for greater moral policing against Muslims of non-conforming genders and sexualities, pushing sexuality and gender further into the realm of marginalized, racialized identity politics in Malaysia. As pointed out by Lisa Dugan in the 12 Life Equality Neoliberalism, uh, Cultural Politics and the Attack on Democracy, the U.S. neoliberal dominance in Asia rose significantly following the Asian economic and financial crisis in 1997. However, among Asian states, Malaysia resisted control by the Global Regulatory Agency, the International Monetary Fund. Iwo Ong refers to the IMF as the strategic aspect of disciplinary neoliberalism. Ironically, the then Prime Minister Dan Sri Dr. Mahathir Mohamad, who had resisted the IMF, had also sacked the then Deputy Prime Minister Dan Sri Dr. Anwar Ibrahim, whom Dr. Mahathir called a fan of the IMF, charging Ibrahim with corruption and sodomy. In the proceedings, Dr. Mahathir openly repudiated homosexuality as a Western disease. While the court case on sodomy charges against Anwar Ibrahim dragged for years, such a crackdown on homosexuality in 1998 also ignited a sexuality rights movement in Malaysia, especially within the feminist movement and human rights movement, alongside the larger political reformation movement in Malaysia. So, as Aiwa Ong points out in Neoliberalism as an Exception, the 1997 Asian financial crisis opened up an opportunity for human rights activism to kick off in Malaysia, spurred by Dr. Mahadeo's public homophobia. Among LGBT identities in Malaysia, the oppression experienced by the transsexual community is especially intense. In 2004, the National Human Rights Organization Suara Rayat Malaysia, Swaram, devoted a special chapter to the transsexual community in its annual report 2004, detailing numerous forms of human rights violations facing the transsexual community in the country. The report attests that prohibition of sex reassignment surgery and cross-dressing are forms of human rights violations towards transsexuals. Increasing evidence confirmed that transsexuals have been subjected to police raids, have suffered the brutality of law enforcement officers, or have been arrested for their transgender appearance, or on charges of gross indecency. Pertinently, the Swaram report highlights that violation of transsexuals' rights to obtain a sex identity change on their identity cards at the re registration department has hindered them from assessing their rights in employment, education, immigration, and transportation. This interlocking system of criminalization and discrimination has been rightly pointed out in the International Gay and Lesbian Human Rights Commission report. One of the important developments of LGBT rights in Southeast Asian region was the formulation of the 2005 Yogyakarta Principles in Indonesia. The Yogyakarta Principles was conceived specifically to provide a more consistent articulation of the rights to sexual orientation and gender identity of the LGBT in international law. In the subsequent years, the Human Rights Commission of Malaysia, Suhakam, was subjected to both regional and international pressure to address the issue of human rights violations of LGBT people in the nation state. 
Debate on the rights of people of non-normative genders and sexualities was set in relation to the non-discrimination principle enshrined in the Federal Constitution of Malaysia was never resolved at the national level. From its inception in 2008, Sexuality Merdeka, direct translation, Sexuality Independence, has been a coalition of sexuality rights activists, feminists, HIV AIDS activists, human rights activists, artists, intellectuals, and civil society organizations who aim to celebrate the human rights of people of diverse gender identities and sexual orientations. The first festival was organized in conjunction with Malaysia's August 31st Independence Day by a small group of gay and lesbian in the capital city Kuala Lumpur in 2008. The co-founder, Pang Kitek, is a member of the Malaysian Rainbow Network, a sexuality rights listserv that was set up in 2003 and affiliated with the Amnesty International Office in Malaysia. Prior to its ban in 2011, the 2010 Sexuality Merdeka was officiated by the chairperson of the Constitutional Law Committee at the Malaysian Bar Council and a representative of the United Nations in Malaysia. In that same year, inspired by the US It Gets Better campaign, the co-founder of Sexuality Merdeka, Pang, started a community-based in It Gets Better in Malaysia project using YouTube and in-house screenings as its major platform. One of the It Gets Better videos featured a Malay Muslim man's coming out story immediately. The video was widely circulated on blogs and Facebook by Malaysian anti-homosexuality individuals who clearly attacked the video with hate speech within just a few days. Activists were not even sure who the attackers were and how many of them existed, but given the more than 30,000 hits on the video and the lopsided hate speech directed at the video, the video was removed by Sexuality Merdeka for safety consideration. All of the previous history set the stage for the confrontation between the government and Sexuality Merdeka in 2011. Despite the open agenda of Sexuality Merdeka, there had been no prior formal action to curtail its Independence Day celebrations. But in 2011, the celebration was banned by the government. If Sexuality Merdeka represents the fight for national recognition, exposing the concerns of constituencies that had been excluded from the nation-building project and links of this fight with Malaysia's fight to gain independence from colonial powers, why was Sexuality Merdeka only banned in 2011? Michael Warner's position in fear of a queer planet, queer politics and social theory is that queer is a resistance to regimes of the normal. In other words, queer epistemology confronts and critiques not only the regimes of heteronormativity, but also other kinds of hierarchies and normative regimes. While Sexuality Merdeka had been operating within an ongoing debate of religious, political tensions in Malaysia. In 2011, Sexuality Merdeka was due to be launched by Ambiga Skrini Wasson, chair of the Coalition for Clean and Fair Elections, also called Bersi. Skrini Wasson is also a former president of the Malaysian Bar Council and a leader of opposition politics in the country. Was the ban of Sexuality Merdeka in 2011 an incidental happening or an indication of a structural crisis? In Time Binds, Queer Temporalities, Queer Histories, Elizabeth Friedman cited Homi Baba, who theorizes about the dialectic between a pedagogical time in which historical events seem to accrete toward a given destiny, and a performative time in which a people recreates itself as such through taking up a given activity simultaneously. Just a few months prior to the 2011 sexuality murdeka, the Brazil 2.0 rarity called the Walk for Democracy and sponsored by the Coalition for Clean and Fair Elections in the capital city, Kuala Lumpur, was estimated to have drawn between 10,000 to over 20,000 people in the demonstration. Despite its smaller turnout compared to the first 2007 Brazil rally, which was estimated to have drawn between 30,000 to 50,000 people in the streets, Brazil 2.0 expanded to the global level, with simultaneously rallies happened in more than 20 cities globally. In the recent 3.0 rally in 2012, an estimated 50,000 and 80,000 people gathered in the streets in the capital city, 
calling for more than 400,000 Malaysians living overseas to vote in the upcoming 13th general election, which is supposed to take place within two months from now. In this light, I would argue that the Malaysian state was threatened by the democratization pro movement led by Bursay, and Bursay's willingness to become an ally to the sexuality merdeka or sexuality rights movement in Malaysia that prompted the ban. <laughs> While the Malaysian state strives to curb the fight for human rights for people of non-normative genders and sexuality using the racialized religious justification, supported by the Islamic legal system in Malaysia, it was even more conscious of the risk of the progressive political activism that could offer these rights beyond the state-led narrow definition of identity politics. While well, Lisa Dugan points out that newly emergent equality politics in the United States led to co-optation of the broad-based progressive movement of the lesbian and gay rights movement, turning it into a form of neoliberal sexual politics, the democratization process in Malaysia provided a possibility for LGBT rights to erupt into a broad-based democratization movement. My question is, would Malaysian state as a site of queer oppression open itself to be demonized by the politics of the United States neoliberal sexual politics? Why are Muslim countries in the Middle East largely targeted in the politics of US homonationalism, while Muslim countries in Southeast Asia are not? More than 60% of the global Muslim population is in Asia. Here, I think just before's concept of conviviality may shed light on the current situation of queer politics in Malaysia or Southeast Asia. Malaysia is a founding member state of the Organization of the Islamic Conference, OIC, since 1969. And Malaysia was the OIC chair from 2003 to 2008. Despite during the 1977 financial crisis, the then Prime Minister Dr. Mahathir Mohamad became notorious with his anti-West rhetoric. Malaysia, under his administration, became an ally to the US in the war against terrorism in the up aftermath of September 11, 2001. It was believed intended to repair its relations with the US to bring back foreign investment from the United States, especially in digital economy, against the shifting to lower cost production in China. As early as the 1970s, Malaysia has been a close political economic ally of the United States in the region of Asia, with the opening up of free trade zones in Malaysia. The United States of America's active investment in Southeast Asia's economic development since the mid-1960s was largely motivated by their foreign policies following the Korean War as a way to step of st stabilizing the region politically. Malaysia, as the founding member of the Association of Southeast Asia Nations, ASEAN, became a strategic partner to U.S. political influence in the region. According to the Foreign Trade Statistic 2008, Malaysia is listed as the 15th trading partner of the United States in terms of imports. And in 2011, at the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation APEC Summit in Hawaii, the President of the United States, Barack Obama, announced a plan to create a Trans-Pacific Free Trade Zone following on the introduction of Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP, by the United States government as a regional strategy to counter the economic growth of China. Recently, Malaysia just became another signatory to the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Despite the close relation to the United States, in the recent establishment of the ASEAN Human Rights Declaration, Malaysia was one of the member states rejected the inclusion of LGBT rights in the charter. Despite Obama's administration highlighted LGBT rights as one of the priority of its foreign policies, Malaysia insists on its rejection on LGBT rights in its nation state as well as in Southeast Asia. So my paper today intends to suggest to include a critical interrogation of the convergence of Islam and neoliberalism as part of the politics of U.S. homonationalism in order to understand the inconsistency of Islamophobia, 
play out in U.S. neoliberal sexual politics as geographical negotiations. In this light, queer politics in Malaysia cannot merely focus on sexuality rights, but also must include a critical analysis of political economy of Malaysia within the encroachment of neoliberalism and a critical engagement with the broader democratization process in the nation. Thank you. Our, our second speaker today is Isle Gross, a member of the faculty of Tel Aviv University's Faculty of Law. He's also a visiting reader at the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. He holds an LLB from Tel Aviv University and an SJD from Harvard Law School. In 1998, he was awarded the Diploma of Human Rights from the Academy of European Law, the Univer uh, European University Institute in Florence. Um, he's co-editor of Exploring Social Rights, which includes his article, The Right to Health in an Era of Privatization and Globalization. And he's also the author of innumerable um, essays. I'll mention a couple of them. Uh, the Construction of a Wall Between the, ha the Hague and Jerusalem, The Enforcement and Limits of Humanitarian Law and the Structure of Occupation in the Leiden Journal of International Law. Um, and uh, secondly, Gender Outlaws Before the Law, The Courts of the Borderlands in the Harvard Journal of Law and Gender. Thank you. 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 Again, and we are at Uh I thought I would have found it, but... Okay, so what I'm going to... Sorry. Yeah, that's a picture that you, not if you know, probably, because it's, but I have a few other that I took, that you want to see it very fast. Uh, so... Uh... That's a picture so, uh, a lot of you saw, maybe. And so in the short time that I have, I'm going to just give really snippets of what is kind of uh, longer research and work. And um, <clears throat> so uh, and, and looking at, at some of the ways that those terms that we hear a lot, homonormativity, which uh, uh, following really uh, uh, Lisa Dugan's book, The Twilight of Equality, and homonationalism, uh, following Jasper Poirs, who will be talking tonight, a book, uh, have been uh, really influential on the discourse about it and actually uh, uh, in, in this conference. So I want to talk a little bit about the, the connection between them and, and queer questions. We can ask about them and, and drawing on context from Israel, but I think that things have probably broader resonance. So uh, in order to you know, understand where the moments that we're analyzing now, of course, we have to talk about a uh, certain history in a way I think we can, when we talk about the link between homonormativity, homonationalism, and pinkwashing, I want to start with homonormativity in a sense which is, in a way, sort of, of course, you can talk about parallel processes, but in a way, sort of preconditioned to the others in the sense that, uh, at least in the context of Israel, you see different development of legal development, political development, econ uh, political economy development, and technological development, which, uh, actually allow the development of uh, this framework of rights recognition in, uh, in certain contexts for same-sex couples when it comes to some couple who write and some parent who write, et cetera. <clears throat> and then, so a lot of the struggle for gay rights are centered around those issues of uh, family rights and another issue that uh, um, was a military service which was actually a relatively uh, short uh, uh, struggle but captured the, the uh, gay rights agenda in 1993. And uh, so, of course, you had to, in a way, succeed in this struggle, which you can call a sort of homonormative battle to enter the state institution in order to be able to, you know, do later the homonationalism and especially the pinkwashing, right? So you have to actually... So, so that's a, a poster by uh, the uh, blue, uh, blue PR and part of this uh, Israel PR campaigns, which says, OK, we're in the Middle East to gay officers serve the country. And, of course, you know, we can look at this poster and see the homonormativity, homonationalism, pinkwashing, all in one. Now, um, I, I want to say that uh, um, 
what, what I want to uh, follow on is, uh, uh, you know, if we're going, if we started with, uh, um, uh, we talked about the military service, this uh, poster in a way represents another issue, the family life, and that's actually a picture I took uh, just uh, last June in the main square in Tel Aviv, Rabin Square, before the Pride event, so this is one of the main posters for Pride event, which actually shows, you know, two men raising the uh, children, and um, also, in a way, referring uh, in the left, it says in Hebrew, Kol Aretz de Galim de Galim, all the country is full with flags, which is a slogan you usually use for Independence Day, Israeli Independence Day, so here used for, but here it's obviously rainbow flag, so you can see the reference to the nationalist uh, symbols. Now, so obviously we can see those, um, you know, the, the um, uh, fights for gay rights being co-opted, uh, I mean, being first of all taking place uh, uh, mainly within the normative framework or within what like, uh, you know, the homonormative framework of we want, you know, the same model of normativity, military service, and equal family rights, be it marriage or parenthood, and to the extent that they are successful, they're being co-opted by the state. And I think that, co uh, I mean, I, I think that the idea of uh, co-optation is an important one that, and I, that uh, I try to, you know, think that, that suggest we have to think about more, because um, um, uh, the idea of being co-opted is a complicated idea because it's not, because it's about the complex relationship between, you know, gay rights activists and the states, and sometimes, you know, they're very happy to be co-opted, but sometimes they want to resist this co-optation. So, um, now, uh, in, when they want to be co-opted, or when they agree to be co-opted, it's part of this, you know, so to say, deal between the states and gay rights activists to agree to be, you know, part of this co-optation, or are willingly being co-opted, or are being complicit with that. And, um, and uh, part of what you know, I've, been, I, I've, I've been pointing to when you look at the history of this in the context of Israel, that there was a process that has been taking uh, on for a while, but the really significant moment was after the uh, homophobic murder of two uh, gay teens in Tel Aviv in 2009, which in a way cemented the, the deal, the kind of new deal or the new Israeli homonationalism, because uh, it, it, as a universal condemnation of the murder, allowed right-wing politicians to, so to say, come out of the closet as being supportive of gay rights, and in a way legitimized, legitimized uh, homo-conservatism or homo right, you know, and, and then just before the recent election, for the first time you saw, for example, gay groups within the right-wing parties, because before that you only had it within the left-wing politics uh, in Israel, right, gay, gay groups. So now you have this new thing of, within the Likud, before the last election, they formed for the first time a right-wing, uh, a gay group, which actually, you know, met with uh, extreme uh, right-wing members of Knesset, who suddenly discovered they're gay-friendly, and even the Likud attacked the religious parties to its right for not being gay-friendly enough. So this is actually, you can call it, you know, domestic pinkwashing, internal pinkwashing, that a party tried to pinkwash itself, right, a right-wing party, etc. Now, um, um, but the, the terms of the deal actually um, requires normativity and not just normativity about sexuality and gender, but also about politics, right? So the, term of, the terms of what I call the deal is that the mainstream gay politics will be embraced, embraced by the government uh, and, and be complicit with it, but for that you'd have to you know, uh, try to push aside or silence uh, critical voices. And you will be agreed to be part of this, uh, uh, you know, homonationalism, where the role, and this has to do with the previous picture, right? Your role from being an, a threat to the state, because in the past when gays were restricted from certain jobs in the army, it was because they were considered a threat to the state, now you become uh, 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 embedded in it. Now, but now I want to talk about really, you know, uh, 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 that's kind of like a very short history. And now I want to talk about two things that's going on. Uh, so if I'm going back to our uh, chair, our chair's description, uh, Professor Dugan's description of uh, homonormativity, uh, so um, it, uh, she described it as a new neoliberal new, new sexual politics that does not contest dominant heteronormative assumptions and institutions, but upholds and sustains them, while promising the possibility of a demobilized gay constituency and privatized, depol depoliticized gay culture anchored in domesticity and consumption. Now, I want to take this and I want to say that actually, uh, one thing that, we, uh, uh, that uh, is going on that I think we need to think about more 
is how the domesticity and the consumption are two, in a way, different and sometimes can be contradictory side of this homonormativity. Or maybe we should talk about two homonormativities. So um, on one hand, uh, we have the context where uh, the state uh, gives rights, recognizes rights, and as long as you are the so-called good gay citizen which fights for his right to be a good soldier or a good uh, family man, uh, and then you are being co-opted. Um, uh, but then, on the other hand, um, uh, uh, whereas this uh, side of human activity is about the domesticity, the consumption side can go to a very different direction. In order to see the connection between the three, homonationalism, pinkwashing, and homonormativity, and the two different contexts of homonormativity, I want to go to yet another picture, which is a picture I took in the beach in Tel Aviv, Hilton Beach, which is a gay beach, again, also last June, before gay pride. Now, what you see here is that uh, this is always a gay beach, but it started because the main cruising park uh, in Tel Aviv, Independence Park, was just above it. Uh, but, uh, uh, so this became the gay beach because of the cruising park. Now, what happened in the last few years as part of gay pride in Tel Aviv and as part of attracting the gay tourism, you see that the government, but not the national government, it's a city government. So actually, this is not homo-nationalism as much as homo-municipalism, okay? Because there are differences between different cities. So the city government takes over the gay beach, puts in the flag, see the rainbow flag with the uh, Israel flag inside, and actually, uh, in a way, you can say the city sponsors cruising, right? So the gay beach, which is about the people who come and consume, this is the consumption side of the homo-nativity. It's normativity, not in the sense of I'll be married and raise kids and have to be home at 10 o'clock, right? You can think following uh, Jewish Deck Halberstam time about the heteronormative time and the queer time. So, in the queer, so, of course, very complex relationship of queer and normativity. But in this het homonormativity is not a parallel of heteronormativity. It's about you have to have the right uh, clothes, the right uh, body, the right gym, the right tourist destination, and... Um, and in here, in this consumption, which is supposedly neoliberal, the state is very much involved in sponsoring it, in giving. And so the homonationalism includes both the homonormativity of the domesticity and the consumption, which can go together to some extent, but only maybe to an extent, because I'm not sure that if you, you know, party all night and, uh, and consume sex and drugs, etc., you can actually leave the heteronormative time of taking those nice kids to school at time, right? So... Uh, uh, so, uh, I haven't tried yet, don't have kids at this stage of life, but that's what I've heard. So, the consumption word of the, of the white gay uh, includes consumption, as I said, of not only clothes, clubs, drugs, and sex, homonormativity. So, I think we have to think, look about the two homonormativities uh, and um, uh, consumption, as I said. Now, uh, the consumption is domestic, domesticity, and, the, and also when we want to think about homonormativity as, as neoliberal, we have to think about the complex relationship of the state which is subsidizing in a way, you know, here by uh, recognizing his rights, and here, in a way, maybe even more by, you know, sponsoring that, this. Now, so that's one thing. Uh, now, another point I want to make, uh, how are we doing at the time? Okay, so, okay, okay, okay. Um, you, you have five minutes. Okay, good. Okay, so, now there's a question of the response to that. And what happens is, uh, as I said, part of the terms of the deal, as I read it, is you have to be good, normative, gays, uh, uh, I guess those are not disturbing enough because they're normative in one way and, you know, they bring money through tourism, etc. But um, uh, it is obviously the investment of the uh, mainstream gay organizations which, in which, uh, you know, it's like a cliche, but yes, in which uh, gay men play a leading role, etc. Jewish gay men, mostly Ashkenazi, although not exclusively, but they play still the dominant role. So it's, it's very interesting, right, that those organizations will not be considered as involved in too much critical dissident voices, gender nonconformity, etc., because the term of the deal then will be broken. Uh, and the deal is that the state will give with some recognition, some rights, not full rights, by the way, right? I always remember this... Uh, uh, um, um, uh, always remember that it's not always full rights and equality, right? But it's some, you'll get some. So, so there's a position. Now, the opposition of the people who say, we don't want to be part of the deal, has a long history in Israel. Going, uh, this is uh, from 2000. This is uh, no pride in occupation. Uh, this is a, even before Black Laundry. Black Laundry grew out of that group. I'm getting there in the back, but it's, you can see that. That's not a picture I took. So the opposition, and what I want to say uh, is, is very briefly the following that um, um, 
so there has been always been, of course, uh, I mean, not always, but there is a long history of uh, queer, left, radical opposition to mainstream gay politics going back here to 2000 and even before, I mean, you know, if we talk about Israel, then I remember the first time that I remember like a pinkwashing action by Netanyahu who was already doing his first term as prime minister in 1999 and already, you know, we talked about it back then. But what we see now is that after the terms of the New Deal, the groups that feel excluded from it want to claim their representation and want to say, okay, you are saying we are, you're speaking on behalf of the LGBT community. However, actually, you are just, you know, what all we see represented are those, you know, white gay men, etc. So what you see is the rise of the identity politics. And you see that, and, and actually, uh, I don't have time to go into it in detail, but you can see uh, how uh, things that we had, like the queer black block, or like black laundry before it, and other things, Tel Aviv queer option, are actually, in a way, being displaced by the transgender block, the bisexual block, the fans block, and all of them, uh, I, I'm not saying that was a critique that I'm doing a bad thing. I think it's, of course, extremely important to have representation of those groups. But what you see is, is the react, in a way, the reaction to the homonormativity is a like, wait, but you are raising for representation, the trans people, uh, the, you know, so all those identities want the representation. And in a way, what we see is almost like this, uh, uh, you know, uh, competition between identities, who, and then, uh, uh, um, uh, and I think that nothing for me signified it more than uh, the addition of the Q, like the GLBTQ, so the cooptation of Q rather than a critique of the idea of identities that put boundaries between us and that we just have to celebrate them without questioning them. So the Q, Q, Q became just one another identity that we have to put in the alphabet soup. And maybe we have, you know, LGBTQ obviously is not enough. We have to have I, but maybe we have to add P for pansexuals and a lot of other things, and G for, another G for gender queer. So, and, and all of those are important, but of course the solution, answer is not there. And what you see uh, is that some of the discourse, for example, so in the last few years, there was like this radical pride in Tel Aviv, which I think was very different than, you know, the black laundry thing. Maybe I'm just being nostalgic, but I think it was very much composed of the different identity groups. And a lot of its slogans were about, for example, um, we want to march not for equality, but for liberation of the identity. Now, for me, that's in a way a victory of the neoliberal, if you say we are marching for liberation of the identity, because liberation of identity without a substantive concept of equality, not the narrow concept of equality, formal equality, liberal, right? is actually liberation within identities and not liberation from them. Now, of course, it's complex dialectics be two minutes, between the need to affirm identities which are excluded and the need to deconstruct them. But I think that what we see today is this, uh, what today is sort of passes for queer politics is like it would be the equivalent of what we used to call like uh, cultural feminism or radical feminism, for example. Right, a combination maybe of, of, of them, which is more about like only affirm, and, and I think that if you just affirm the identities, if you believe, you know, if you, that uh, actually those identities, we need to affirmation in a world which is like uh, discriminatory against them, but actually that the identities which are built on binaries and hierarchies are something that an uh, uh, ultimate queer uh, project is actually liberation from them and not just liberation within them, then you ask questions about what happened to queer politics and how much, for me at least, the neoliberal and nationalist politics succeeded by splintering the, this uh, queer coalition maybe into those identity groups which are mostly busy fighting each other <laughs> to a large extent. And, and of course, you that does not mean you should erase power relationship. You should not discuss how groups are raised from presentation. You should not think it's important to represent those groups. But I think that's something that we have to ask about this victory of homonormativity and what, what does queer politics mean now? Thank you. Okay, moving along. Our third speaker is Elena Kiesling. Have I pronounced that correctly? Almost, yes. Almost. Um, is a doctoral candidate in the American Studies Department at the Johannes Gutenberg University Mainz in Germany, where she received an MA in American Studies and Sports Science in 2010. She's currently part of the International Program for Performance and Media Studies at Mainz. Her current research interests include multiple identity and community formations across, across queerness and race. Her dissertation project, Aesthetics of Coalition and Protest, deals with the performance of queer community in experimental film. 
In her leisure time, she attempts to incorporate her two lives as an academic and professional athlete to develop a queer art of coaching. Elena. So I'm um, going to pile right on to the discussion about uh, identity and queerness. And to give you a little bit of context here, the papers I heard over the last one and a half days all focused on very narrow and specific projects and contexts. My paper is actually going to diverge a little. Speak a little more directly into the mic. Your voice is getting Is that lost. better? Um, better? Okay. <laughs> So my paper is actually going to diverge a little bit from this approach, and so far as it investigates rather broader abstract questions about community identity and the possibility of a queer community at the intersection of sexuality and race. Coming from a European cultural background, specifically a German background, but being trained in American studies, thus the focus on a US context, I see a lot of similarities in the ways in which the queer community is constructed within westernized queer theory, activism, and also the media. Especially when we think of the context of this conference, homonationalism and pinkwashing, it becomes tremendously important to remain critical of a westernized view of queerness and to engage in intersectional work. While there are certainly many important intersections in need to be addressed, my focus is on the intersection of race and queerness and the messy context of queering race, racializing queerness, and what I want to call queering whiteness. In the wake of neoliberalism's pressing attempts to break collectivities apart and individualize society according to niche marketing strategies, the idea of a national, even transnational, queer community still prevails. Yet the theoretical possibility, political and practical usefulness of this community can be highly doubted, especially when it is troubled with the intersection of ethnicity and sexuality. The juxtaposition of a very essential concept, such as community, with an anti or de-essential concept like queerness is contradictory and begs the question how we can think of community post-identity. With the intentionally broad title, The Imagined Queer Community, I would like to invoke Benedict Anderson's idea of an imagined community that functions in the way we imagine it. It is important to remember the, re the utopian nature of community because the way in which we imagine our communities determines how we act on behalf of them. I would like to emphasize the importance of thinking beyond the current self-inflicted borders within the community in order to imagine a queer community that offers people outside the homonational structure a safe space. Queer liberalism has made the white gay male, cisgender male, the community's poster boy, ignoring intragroup differences and abandoning queer politics in favor of an increasing incorporation into the nation state. Therefore, two questions are my primary concern. Is a pan-ethnic queer community possible? And what role can this community play at the intersection of community, identity, and nation? The need for a sense of belonging and collectivity has constantly grown in the last decades. Sharon Holland calls this the stubborn insistence that we do belong to one another despite our ever efforts at home and in the institution to lose track of it, if not forget altogether such belonging, close quote. However, in the attempt to create community and collective identity against neoliberalism's attempts to fragment each, the resulting queer community, queer community sorry, currently homogenizes highly individual queer life experiences. The illusion of a transnational queer identity overshadows the individuality of queer experiences not only on different sides of national borders, but also within one single cultural context. This illusion forecloses any valuable discourse about forging alliances across differences without erasing them, an approach third world feminism advocated already decades ago. Just recently, Clarks hosted a dialogue that aimed at the exploration of how the queer movement could be transformed to serve the interests of all parts of the queer communities. I believe the use of the plural here, queer communities, although certainly not new, is very interesting because it hints at the inarticulateness of diversity within the queer community itself. It acknowledges the heterogeneity of queer lives and experiences that cannot be easily pinned down in one queer identity and one queer community. At the same time, however, the use of the plural expresses an impossibility. It indicates the difficulty of queer organizing of the basis, on the basis of a truly inclusive queer community. But what are these queer communities if not fractures of a greater queer community? 
and why is it not possible to transform the queer movement to serve the interest of one queer community? As innocent as these questions may sound, I believe they express an underlying concern that results from the ambiguous relationship between community and identity, especially after the critique of identity, and that surfaces particularly when imagining a pan-ethnic queer community. The intersection between sexuality and race remains an underexamined chapter within queer politics, haunted by the different implications of identity on race and queerness that continues to trouble truly transformative queer politics. The queer community has for a long time remained critical of identity and searched for other ways for creating community which allows people to live without embracing an identity that has been designed to mark them as other. However, it is this ambiguous relationship between queerness, identity, and community which poses a problem for the intersection of queerness and race because discard identity altogether ignores the lived realities of many people of color for whom racial identity is still a major determinant of their life choices. Sorry. <laughs> Recently, the current mainstream queer community has started to ignore this ambiguous relationship by creating a queer identity structured through whiteness, among, of course, other normative markers of identity. It largely remains ignorant of non-white identities, and some of the leading LGBT organizations, for example, refuse to acknowledge racism on a broader structural level, let alone recognize it within their own organizational formation and political actions. Kathy Cohen summarized it nicely, and I quote, in spite of the unequal power relationships located in marginal communities, I'm still not interested in disassociating politically from those communities, for queerness, as it is currently constructed, offers no viable political alternative. It invites us to put forth a political agenda that makes invisible the prominence of race, class, and to varying degrees gender in determining the life chances on those on both sides of the hetero-queer divide. The awareness of the difficulty of building community on the basis of queerness as critical of identity and oppositional to so-called norm, instead of creating a new homonormative queer identity, while recognizing that some of these oppositional positions are still structured through modes of identity such as race and gender, remains an ongoing project for queer politics. It is, it is a particular important project now given the illusion of a colorblind society led by a black president and supposedly gay-friendly political climate in which Obama's recent support of same-sex marriage and Hillary Clinton's speech on gay rights as human rights are at the forefront of a new queer liberalism. Yet beyond the support within the Obama administration and beyond all legal and political achievements, it is easily overlooked that there is more to social justice than laws and rights and that queer rights are certainly not the last civil rights struggle. Some events in recent and not so recent LGBT history have shown the difficulty of creating a dialogue between communities of color and the queer community that make the building of a pan-ethnic queer, uh, pan queer community difficult, not only on an abstract theoretical level, but also on a practical material one. The discussion surrounding the passing of Proposition 8 in California, for example, has spurred the LGBT community against the African American and Latino community. Also, the tremendous whitewashing of Stonewall continues to trouble one of the quintessential sites of memory for an imagined queer community. An intersectional rereading of these events in the past can be helpful to imagine a pan ethnic queer community in the present and future. Rereading Stonewall, for example, as the exemplary intersectional moment in the past means engaging in the rewriting of history and memory in order to enable coalitional work in the present and future. Although it is commonly referred to as a start of the gay and probably also and male liberation movement, it is more apt to read Stonewall as the birth of the queer community since it held a lot of potential for coalition building around queerness in the sense of oppositional positions to dominant and normative forms of power. Original testimony of Stonewall describes the event as a move against police brutality and police discrimination, which not only involved gay and transgender people frequenting the Stonewall Inn, but which also involved people of color because of their shared frustration with police brutality. The beginnings of the movement made little difference between anti-poverty uh, anti -poverty politics, sorry, queer rights, and anti-racist agendas. This is an image rarely evoked when remembering Stonewall. 
On the contrary, celebrations of the event have turned into high consumerism festivals, mostly devoid of political agendas. Similarly, the few discussions that were sensitive to the intersections of race and queerness after Proposition 8 have given way to an overwhelming support for same-sex marriage within the mainstream queer community. Indeed, and I quote Jack Halberstam here, the desire for marriage completes a long process by which LGBT people, having been separated out from normative society and called pathological, are now embraced and in turn embrace the very culture that previously rejected them, end of quote. The romantic ideal of marriage remains ignorant of the lived realities of many queer families for which marriage is not the ultimate solution. Especially for queer people of color, it is unlikely that same-sex marriage protects their relationships in the same way that it does for white marriages, given the racist structures within the US. The repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell also shaped the current mainstream queer community, or the queer movement, and also lacked an intersectional approach. There were some of those there were some who were strongly in favor of a repeal and those who said that the queer movement should not support the military in the first place. Both analyses fail to speak about Don't Ask, Don't Tell from a position aware of the intersection of sexuality and race. The fact that was hardly ever mentioned was that queer women of color were disproportionately harmed by Don't Ask, Don't Tell and discharged on allegations of being gay. Again, a valuable discussion about the variety of queer lives was missing. A queer movement and a queer community cannot, however, ignore the lived realities of its own members. Rethinking these events that shape the movement in the past and present through an intersectional mode enables the queer movement to, or the queer community to incorporate difference in their politics and aim for an inclusive, possibly pan-ethnic queer community. Coming back to my original questions, Given the theoretical ambiguities inherent in the different implications of identity for community, queerness, and race, and also the practical challenges, a pan-ethnic queer community seems somewhat implausible. Yet it is this implausibility of a queer community which shields it from an early incorporation into the nation state and into a homonormative and homonational structure. What role then can this community play at the intersection between community, identity, and nation? First of all, it can create a dialogue between the social, cultural, and political realm if it remains aware of the ambiguous relationship between identity formation and power structures that work in tandem with each other. Simultaneously, it can remain critical of representational goals aiming at the affirmation of previously denigrated identities while working toward greater social justice. Both goals are situated at different ends of the political scale that tend to interfere with each other. By remaining in this utopian state, an imagined queer community can also retain its critical position toward the nation. After all, what politician has ever literally addressed the queer community? If we carefully invest in the rewriting of memory of the queer community and the building of a pan-ethnic queer community, we engage in a racialization of queerness and the queering of race in order to empower new forms of community organizing after identity in the ambivalent sense of the statement. After identity meaning on the one hand after discarding identity, but after identity also meaning after the creation of, of an identity on which a community can potentially be based. The resulting politics are not easily grounded in already established categories, but remain messy and multifaceted and critical of a homonational structure. It's time to stop the inflationary usage of the term queer community indebted as it is to whiteness and instead put it to more responsible uses. Failure to do so results in the ultimate homogenization of queerness into an identity structured through right, whiteness and incorporated into a normative framework devoid of pol radical politics and readily available for consumption. It also results in the eradication of safe spaces essential for people's survival outside a homonational structure. As Pratiba Parmar cleverly formulated, we can only be effective in any collective actions if we feel safe. Safety is essential for our daily survival. Safe spaces allow us to flourish, celebrate, and work together to make a difference. Thank you. I almost never have to lower a mic, that's scary. <laughs> um, 
Um, I, um, the next speaker is Serena Bassi, um, and uh, Serena is an early career research fellow at Warwick University in the UK. Her research interests include translation studies and sexuality studies. Her current research is on the role of translation in the history of the formation of gay identity. Hello. Okay, um, so this paper offers um, a series of reflections on the representation of homosexuality in a mainstream cultural product. The aim is to explore how sexual practices that do not conform to heterosexual norms are represented and given meaning to in a particular social, cultural, and historical context. However, what makes this analysis different from most analyses of queer representation in popular culture is that it, focu it focuses on a translated text rather than on an original. I'm doing that because in a cultural marketplace that is increasingly global, it is insufficient to analyze pop popular culture and the ideas around sexuality it circulates through a national and a monolingual perspective. Firstly, Audiences of mass cultural products do not all access those products in the same language. Um, they're often products written originally in English, but they wouldn't be accessed in English necessarily. Um, secondly, national traditions of literary, cinematic, and televisual representation do not exist in a void, but rather constantly influence each other through multiple processes of translation. Moreover, and now I'm coming to the main topic of, of this conference, as embedded global inequalities powerfully resonate in discourse around sexuality and liberation, the circulation of cultural products and entertainment experiences outside national boundaries cannot simply be deemed positive in the name of bridge building and, further inter uh, and furthering intercultural dialogue. It, it needs to be unpicked further. Um, today, Translatability, the ability to translate something in a foreign language across linguistic, cultural, and social context, contexts is often built into a cultural product which aims to achieve the status of a glob global mass, mass cultural object. The idea of an internal, internationalized aesthetic should not, of course, um, evoke images of a, of a democratic transnational field of exchange in which national cultures across the globe are equally represented. In fact, much of what passes for an internationalized aesthetic, an international aesthetic, results, in fact, from a series of acts of translation from English, uh, with its hypercentral position in the international translation system. I've, I've, I'm going to focus on one particular example, which only acts as an example here of what I'm trying to um, say about translation and uh, cultural imperialism. And it's uh, an, an Italian bestseller. Um, it's called Cento Colpi di Spazio Prima di Andare a Dormire. And it was translated, it's a fictional um, memoir of a sexual coming of age uh, that contains much sexually explicit material and was thus uh, received as a scandalous bestseller. In 2006, it was translated by, uh, into English by Lawrence Venuti, um, who is an American celebrity translator and a scholar, and a scholar of translation. Um, after a brief explanation of the book's content and of what place the representation of queerness occupies in the original text, I will go on to identify three instances in which the changes operated on the text by the translator have resulted into a particular understanding of queerness of the original being normalized into an Anglo-American homonormative understanding of queerness. Um, the book's protagonist's uh, journey of discovery of our sexuality, although pre predom predominantly heterosexual, also enters the, the realm of queer sex and relationships. Um, in this description that you can read um, in both in Italian and in the translated text, um, in this description of the local lesbian and gay center where the protagonist spends an afternoon, the concept of a comunità gay is clearly a translation from English, 
since the, the, the phrase imitates the English language expression gay community. This translation um, embedded in the original text, so the text already contains the translation, um, brings with it the specific meanings of the English term gay and the phrase gay community with the conceptualization of sexuality but also subjectivity and identity that the English language phrase implies. Um, in the novel, at least one mention of each of the identities evoked by the acronym LGBT is incorporated in the story, um, which allows the author to embed an archive of alternative sexual subcultures and contemporary sexual identities in the text, uh, thereby uh, enhancing the translatability of the product, making the product um, um, more appealing to, to contemporary um, mass audiences because um, contemporary discourses around sexual identity do, do have a particular appeal. Um, so I'm, I'm actually going to uh, show you three, I'm, I'm doing a textual analysis of three particular um, micro level examples of shifts that the translator has applied from the original text to the translated text. Um, they, they all, um, all these examples apply to one particular character who is um, the, the queer character that is most present in the narrative. Um, his name is Ernesto and he's a friend of the, of the protagonist. The first example um, is the very first time that we meet this character in the narrative. In uh, the source text, in the original text, uh, the protagonist introduces the character Ernesto by informing the reader of, the, of her new encounter. A significant translation shift in the target text, um, so what I've done here, I've put the original, the original Italian, then I've, I've given my own translation that has, has stayed pretty literal, and then uh, the, 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 the published transla translation. A significant shift here in the target text draws the two characters closer to each other and endows their bond with a particular magic that is absent in the source text. This afternoon I went out with Ernesto, a guy I met in a chat room. He immediately seemed like a kindred spirit. In the original, um, the word used to describe him is simpatico, which is a positive but, but casual evaluation of character. Uh, so I translated it in English as, as nice guy. Uh, whereas he immediately seemed like a kindred spirit, suggests that she identifies with him, and the bond contains an element of predestination. Uh, when uh, his sexual orientation is disclosed a couple of pages later, the reader of the target test is encouraged to understand uh, his, the sexual orientation of the character as the reason for his privileged relationship with, with, the, with the main character, uh, since such depth to the friendship cannot be explained by any particular event in the story. Thus, the target text is saying something that the source text does not say. Uh, Ernesto, as a man who was, uh, was attracted to men, can relate especially well to Melissa, who has found in him not just a friend, but a kindred spirit. This works in two ways. It forewarns the reader about Ernesto's sexuality before he actually comes out to Melissa and to the reader, and it guides the interpretation of Ernesto's difference in one particular direction. In fact, the gay, as we're, you're, you're all aware, the gay male, straight female, be, best friends narrative has become possibly the most common device to introduce a gay character in romantic comedies and in sitcoms. Um, commentators agree that far from questioning the heterosexual order, the gay best friend's popularity in this new era of LGBT visibility rests on his ability to represent sexual alterity in a non-threatening fashion. My other textual example um, comes from uh, the scene when Ernesto comes out um, to his friend. Um, when Melissa and Ernesto find themselves alone in his flat for the first time, after, after coming across his large collection of female clothes, uh, she initiates an open discussion about their private life, which encourages him to come out to her as a cross-dresser and eventually as a sex worker. 
Ernesto's coming out to Melissa is somewhat atypical in that he does not make direct reference to his sexual desires or to his sexual life. What is queer about him is not that he's attracted to men, although that is also implied, but, that he, he, but the fact that he identifies with women and feels more like himself when he's dressed as, as the opposite gender. The, translates, the translation here presents again a significant shift in the description of the character's movements. So in my literal translation, he opened the door with a violent gesture, con un gesto violento. Violento is clearly same root as violent, so it wouldn't have been difficult to just translate it as violent. Um, but in the actual published transla translation, this becomes, then he dramatically threw open one door, pointed at the clothes hanging there and said, these are mine. An adjective that is commonly associated with hegemonic masculinity, violent or violent, is replaced by dramatically, an adverb that conforms neatly to one particular Western articulation of alternative rather than hegemonic masculinity, gay masculinity. In the description of his gestures as dramatic, the translator mo uh, more or less a Probably, possibly not in an aware fashion, but he mobilizes camp as a powerful cultural signifier. Since, as we know, camp as a, as a sensibility foregrounds the metaphor of life as theater, the adverb, the adverb dramatically associated to a man who is sexually attracted to men could be interpreted in this context as presenting the character as camp. The two shifts analyzed he here work together to operate one coherent transformation. In the target text, uh, Ernesto becomes the camp gay friend of the female protagonist in a kind of post-feminist narrative kind of way. Okay, there's a third example um, relating now to, to sexual practices. Um, when uh, then the character later asks him, uh, as part of the coming out scene, whether he's also doing sex work, and um, Ernesto covers his face in shame and says, and I'm reading my translation again, uh, Meli, believe me, I only give blowjobs, nothing more. Uh, someone sometimes asks me to, some fact, but I, but I swear, I never do it. Um, in the source text, uh, Ernesto distances himself from he, his own queerness in two ways. Firstly, is not able to, open, to openly speak about gay sex and stops mid-sentence. Secondly, secondly, the character displays his internalized homophobia, if we, if we want to call it that way, uh, referring to his male clients um, with the homophobic insult, rotting culo. Ernesto evokes the sex act of penetrating other men through a homophobic reference to gay men, thereby forcefully denying ever having performed it. In the target text, the same coming out as a queer sex worker becomes, uh, Meli, believe me, I only do oral sex, nothing else. Someone may ask, may ask me to take it up the ass, but I swear I never do it. Firstly, uh, both Ernesto's homophobic remark and his an inability to refer clearly to gay sex are erased from the target text. I am interested here in the writing out of, of uh, anything that is not proud enough, you know, of anything that um, might um, disclose doubt or uncertainty for something that is much more clearly coded, straightforwardly coded as gay. Um, secondly, why is the source text covertly refers to the fact that Ernesto's clients have asked him to penetrate them anally? In the target text, the sexual act becomes that of being penetrated. So that's also a big change. Um, the significance of the three, sh the significance of the three shifts um, of the three changes in the translation that I've just detailed above lies, for me, in their ability to rewrite Ernesto's sexual identity. In all of the examples of the offered above, uh, Venuti, the translator, tweaks Ernesto's articulation of his identity in the story according to an existing script of how gay men relate to women as the gay friend, of how they act out their sexuality through their gender performance in the imagery of camp, and how they behave sexually through the idea that a man who dresses as a woman would be expected to be penetrated. A character who was in the original ambiguously and contradictory in the articulation of his sexual and gender identity in the source text 
um, well, in the source text, he becomes, instead in the, in the target text, in the translation, clearly coded as gay. Now, gay is the operative, is an English word, for a start, and it's the operative term of Western political activism around, or Anglo-American political activism around homosexuality. That of a gay community is the idea that a series of subjects that are knowable through, a, through the concept of a gay identity have common interests, ways of life, a common culture, and common political objectives, amongst which that of visibility. Through the character of Ernesto, the concern for visibility is actually turned on its head, um, both because his visibility does not correspond to the visibility of any specific discrete group of people defined through the sexual desires, and because as a sex worker, he hardly conforms to the positive role model rhetoric. Um, in the original, um, what, what I'm trying to say is that um, I see the character, this character in the original already as, a, as in itself as a sort of translation of the concept of gay that is embedded in the text. But as it always happens with translations, they're not just imitations, they are reconfigurations, they are renegotiations of a concept. Um, and so as such, in the, in the original, this translation opens up for new meanings and new associations with, um, with the idea of gay. Um, however, in the once that's translated back into English, when another layer of interpretation gets added, uh, this rewriting of what gay means is renormalized um, once again in, in a subtle way, as I should, but I would say that's a form of renormalization. Um, and it's disciplined through a series of intertextual relations to a distinctively Anglo American archive of representation. Uh, a homonormative archive of, of representation. Um, so, to conclude, in uh, how much time? You're fine. You have plenty of time. Okay. Well, I'm still concluding. Um, so, so here for me, um, what I wanted to. So, I guess my intervention was a bit different from the rest in that it was about the politics of language um, and the politics of uh, cultural transfer and um, homonormativity for me. Um, is, could be understood as a set of words that get quoted, rewritten, and translated with specific political consequences. Um, the gay imperialism of my title is, of course, a cultural imperialism. Um, so not, not as kind of um, vividly violent as a... As a as a military imperialism, but still um, with important political consequences. Um, imposing an, Engl an English language archive of representation on all other representations of sexual alterity and passing it as what the cultural other actually has to say um, through the medium of translation means um, being able to claim to be representing others and to, to be able to claim to be circulating what others have to say and yet um, making sure that that's not too different from anything else that circulates in, in the domestic culture. So, yeah, that's, that's just an example of, of that kind of process. <coughs> Okay, and so our, our last presentation, um, the, the last paper that's listed for this panel on the program, the presenters are not here. So our last presentation uh, will be by uh, Douglas Haynes, and Doug is a doctoral candidate in political science at McGill University, where he's writing a dissertation on the role of suffering in feminist theory. Not suffering through, but suffering in. And uh, his other research interests include the politics of experience and materiality, Marx's use of imagination, and the uses of biology in political science research. Doug. Um, thank you to the conference organizers for putting this great conference together. This is pretty amazing. Uh, this is the first time I've delivered a paper like at a lectern, so this is a little weird. I'm used to sitting at a table. And the first time with an iPad, which is also a little weird. So bear with me if things go horribly off the rails. Um, so my goal in this paper, which is entitled uh, selling out, oh gosh, selling out, question mark, um, 
hegemony, homo normalization, and the politics of the meantime, uh, is to intervene in one aspect of, homo norm of the homo normativity and homo nationalism literature by looking at its approach to don't ask, don't tell, and the pursuit of access to military service by parts of the LGBT movement. Slow down a little. Okay, thanks. <laughs> like other theorists of homo normativity, I oppose the way that the privileging of military service has purchased national membership for gays and lesbians. Um, in order to participate in the neoliberalizing and imperial ventures of the US state. And I also oppose the false universalization of white middle class gay men's and lesbians' interests as those of all queer people. And finally, the way that, as numerous scholars have observed, this has allowed racism, gender normativity, and xenophobia to go unchallenged within gay and lesbian activist groups. And yet, of course, I also worry that decrying attempts to access military service is ignoring the role that military service has and continues to play in the lives of many young middle class and working class people, gay and lesbian ones included, for whom it provides opportunities for education, housing, healthcare, and other important government controlled resources. That is, while critics of the focus on Don't Ask, Don't Tell have characterized the desire for military service solely in terms of gay and lesbian nationalism, in no small part because this is how its proponents have argued it, this univocal, univocal criticism reproduces the silences that, LGBT, that those LGBT folks for whom the motivations to join the military service are more complicated. I contend it is necessary to complicate the accounts of race, class, gender, sexual, and national subjectivities and objecthoods of members and putative members of the military in our accounts of homonormativity, ones that recognize the hegemony of the state in producing vulnerable, sub vulnerable subjects who depend upon the state itself. So for example, um, as we already heard, uh, queer women of color are the ones who are discharged most frequently under don't ask, don't or are sort of most disproportionately affected by don't ask, don't tell discharges or were. Um, and uh, 2008 was the most successful year for military recruitment since the beginning of the invasions of Af Afghanistan and Iraq and is a direct result of the rising levels of unemployment in the United States. Thus, if we see the military not only as an agent of US violence abroad, but also as an employer, and indeed the US Department of Defense is the largest single employer in the United States, then we will need to rethink the nature of our criticism through homonormativity. So just as we may find fault with undue focus on employment non-discrimination legislation for private employers, we also recognize its necessity for queer people to get jobs and continue to live. Um, and I think we need to extend that same ambivalence uh, to the military itself. Indeed, I think an apt extension of the criticisms of neoliberalism of which homonormativity was a part is to focus on the reduction of alternative means of accessing these kinds of resources outside the military, especially as government austerity measures have further cut funding to social welfare programs and education. Thanks. Uh, social welfare programs and education programs that would otherwise have provided alternatives to joining the military. So these call, uh, this sort of ambivalent criticism of don't ask, don't tell, while also recognizing the centrality of the military to many people's lives, um, calls attention to what I'm going to term the politics of the meantime. This is the seeming conflict between the demands of long-term structural change for the purposes of liberation and the more immediate demands of those citizens living here now before those long-term changes have been realized and whose political agency is supposed to produce the change even as that change is meant to li liberate them and give them political agency. So we have what I think of is as a temporal problem. We have long-term change that is supposed to liberate people, but somehow those people are meant to be participants in that change that is supposed to liberate them. And it's not clear where this sort of chicken egg liberation actually takes place. The potential conflict is uh, let's see, yes. The potential conflict is especially noticeable in the context, context of the hegemony of the state and other non-state institutions over the lives of, the especial, of especially vulnerable persons, such as the poor, people of color, migrants, the disabled, and then gender non-conforming. And it's important to sort of think in terms of the military that not only are people of color and working class people especially um, likely to join the military, but that the military has also made a concerted effort to reach out to migrants in the United States to, um, to use military service as a means to citizenship. So we also want to think about sort of that transnationalizing of military service. These people, as we know, are often the objects of state and other disciplinary institutions acts insofar as these institutions act upon them and in so doing act to create their lives and the alternatives that are available within those lives. 
Um, and so in the context of military service, seeking not to join the military may have been an option that the state and these other institutions discouraged by reducing the availability of other choices through, for example, the aforementioned uh, government austerity program, uh, cuts to social services and education. The concept of the politics of the meantime, if not the term, should be familiar to us from other social struggles. I'm going to focus here on one social struggle um, or one theorization of a social struggle, trans politics. Recent scholarship on trans issues enables us to think about the simultaneity of human existence as both subject and object, as actor and as, cre as creature of powerful institutions. For authors like Sandy Stone, Susan Stryker, Paisley Curra, and Dean Spade, one's status as an object of others' actions makes possible subject positions that can challenge normative systems, especially those for trans people of gender, but also we want to think through race, sexuality, class, and nation. Like gay and lesbian struggles over access to state resources such as marriage, hate crime protection, and military service, Trans politics has struggled with the same issues, as well as those of government identification for gender purposes and the provision of medical treatments for those trans people who desire them. I'm actually gonna grab my water bottle really quickly. In a vague Marco Rubio awkwardness. Where was I? For, all right, so like gay and lesbian struggles over access to state resources, this is also a debate that's happening in trans theory and trans politics. For many trans scholars, the proper concern of trans politics is the immediate concerns uh, of survival in many cases, but also access to medicine and the ability to identify as one chooses. Um, so for example, Vivian Namaste argues that trans Sexual politics, she argues for transsexual politics, and this will, that term will become important, are not matters of larger social transformation in systems of gender, but are instead simply issues of individual survival in the face of state and societal violence and the diminishment of those individuals' life choices and options as a result. For Namaste, the emphasis in the last two decades on transgender theory as opposed to transsexual theory and identity has distracted from the concrete policy changes that need to happen in order to save real lives. She prefers the term transsexual because of this emphasis on allowing people, in her words, simply to live as men or women as they choose, and, and as every other non-transsexual man and woman does, and because it highlights the concrete needs they have access, they, concrete needs they have uh, to access, for example, hormones and surgery and other services. But I think this sets the politics of the meantime against those of long-term systemic change, and for Namaste, co clearly comes down on the, form, on the side of the former. Um, so what this means is that many transsexuals, I think in Namaste's theory, end up merely as recipients of the state action and doesn't actually combat the vulnerability that that state action likewise produces. But there are those trans theorists for whom, in my reading at least, this trade-off is illusory. There is no necessary conflict between what I'm terming the politics of the meantime and this longer-term structural change. For these theorists, the politics of the meantime makes possible long-term change by enabling the recreation of political subjects through their engagement alongside other similarly situated subjects in the political process. In Namaste's format, formation, formulation, transsexuals remain individual recipients of state resources and so must constantly fight on those grounds without necessarily shifting the ways in which that fight can help prepare for the next fight and the next fight and the next fight. There's no sense that these struggles could ever point to larger struggles that may bring in other people who are likewise affected by institutions but don't necessarily identify the same way or aren't necessarily affected in the same way. In contrast, in, say, Sandy Stone's now classic The Empire Strikes Back, she issues a call for trans people to cease passing and embrace their honest life stories, the exact opposite of Namaste's work. I mean, it's pretty on its face, right? It's a post-transsexual manifesto from Stone. Um, so to move from the notion of transsexual to the notion of uh, transgender or some other sort of trans. For Stone, this transition in one's account of one's own life does not eliminate the need for medical resources, but it reconceives the way in which the fight for that access takes place and the kinds of subjects slash objects that it results in. Stone is clear about the affinities she thinks this trans project has with feminist projects of gender liberation and is in fact able to issue a strong corrective to their totalizing transphobic understandings of gender, the feminists, that is. 
Dean Spade, in his recent Normal Life, argues, so this is another uh, way, we, uh, another theorist I think we can, uh, that helps us think through the politics of the meantime more productively. Um, Dean Spade argues that the primary value of certain groups of trans folks making claims against the state, such as for the provision of gender appropriate housing for people in need, access to gender appropriate medical care, and to eliminate the barriers to changing gender on government identification, Spade argues that this value has been in part through their reformation as members of a political community who are realizing their agency collectively. So they go from being vulnerable, and even though that vulnerability is never actually eliminated um, or isn't necessarily eliminated, they also become citizens or something like citizens. Thus for Spade, even a failure to achieve an immediate policy change is not a complete loss the way it would have to be for Namaste, for the trans people will persist as political agents and members of a larger political collective uh, group. The politics of the meantime in the context of Spade's theory changes them from primarily vulnerable objects of state and institutional action and often violence into subjects and objects of one another's collective and shared actions, embedding their agency within a community of fellow citizens. What I'm proposing then is a greater attention to the politics of the meantime within critical gay and lesbian and queer theory and politics to articulate homonormativity in a way that also takes account of state hegemony in many people's lives and to incorporate this rethinking, this retemporal thinking um, into a new politics. What I take away from critical trans theorizing is the way that this become, that this rethinking um, becomes expansive and more deeply critical so that we can change both material resources and gender norms at the same time. We can engage in the politics of the meantime and longer term transformative projects. Um, and that we can do this sort of constantly provisionally and constantly with the ability to renew. I turned to trans politics in part because I wanted to highlight what Susan Stryker has called uh, the older formulation of homonormativity, one that describes the ways in which trans people are marginalized within gay and lesbian femi and feminist groups. Stryker's understanding of homonormativity challenges the hierarchies and exclusions that persist in gay and lesbian politics as um, other theorists of homonormativity do. And she highlights the way that trans politics was historically about, historically about quote, making common cause with any groups, including, including non-transgender gays, lesbians, and bisexuals who contested heterosexist privilege. But she also points to the ways in which the very movements in which we participate undermine our abilities to think expansively and foreclose criticism of the very foundations of gay and lesbian identity as itself the product of and contributing to the maintenance of an ontologized gender system. Reinf Slow down again. Thanks. <laughs> Reinforced by the power of state and disciplinary institutions. I'm clearly not going to go for 20 minutes. Uh, and yet the hegemony of gender and its violent enforcement by and for the state is one under which we must live insofar as we are all the objects of this violent uh, state. Thinking of the politics of the meantime, of politics taking place while that system persists, enables us to think about the ways in which we can make ourselves into agents who challenge that system and bring about its eventual end, even, after, even as we have to live under it. Okay. So coming back briefly to the question of gays and lesbians in the military, now that we've gone through our sort of larger theoretical framework. If we acknowledge the, the role that the military plays in many people's lives, especially vulnerable, vulnerable people, then we need to find ways in which the need to access the military can be made to contribute to, rather than be exclusive of the formation of citizens who are better able to participate in longer term liberatory political <coughs> change. So I wanna make the claim that I don't think that serving in the military is necessarily um, completely counter to a queer politics as uh, it's often theorized. In their essay, Queen's Body, King's Member, uh, Susan Stryker and Nikki Sullivan link the regulation of transsexual gen genital modification to, to state regulation and the appropriation of bodies for military purposes. Uh, they do it through a really neat uh, tracing of the use of mayhem laws historically. Um, it's a pretty great article if people haven't read it. Um, I think it's important to retain this link between trans bodies and military bodies. Um, and it's important to retain it in how we approach the role of access to the military um, when we're doing queer politics um, and we're ad when we're advocating for certain kinds of policies. So after Tori, along with Stryker then and moving beyond Stryker, we need to make common cause not only with those who are challenging gender norms, 
um, although we also need to do that. But we also need to make a uh, common cause with those whose bodies the state is appropriating for its own violent ends and who often lack the resources to challenge it. So Dean Spade often stresses the fact that it is the state that is trying to kill trans people. And if we really think about it, the state is also trying to kill members of the military who are often working class people and people of color and immigrants. There is, I think, a strong, a strong uh, affinity between these two that I think we need to think, strong, uh, think more about and address politically. So this may mean more practically that even as we oppose the homo-normalizing discourse that is occurring in the gay and lesbian movement with regards to the military and other state institutions, we likewise support greater wages for service members for, so this is some examples of things we can do. We might support greater wages for service members who often um, are required to supplement their military income with um, food stamps and other uh, government welfare programs. We may support the regulation of for-profit colleges that prey upon service members' desire to um, pursue further education after their military careers and sort of are trying to capitalize on the access to government uh, funds, yet provide really substandard education and increase, we may also increase, uh, support an increase in educational um, and other forms of support for veterans who've left military services, um, as well as increasing uh, financial support from the government for those institutions that may help people not have to join the military in the first place, um, thus helping them access education, healthcare, jobs, and other uh, resources. Um, so I think to do otherwise, to ignore this aspect of military service, is to cut off those who need it, uh, who need the military, or who have needed the military at any rate, in order to survive, um, and to pit the politics of the meantime against the possibilities of longer, tra uh, longer term transla transformation. Thank you. There's, there's another panel uh, that starts in here at 3 o'clock. So I would say we have about 10 or 15 minutes for, uh, for questions and comments. This session is being live streamed. So if you have a, a comment or a question, please come and speak into one of the microphones on either side. Um, and people on the panel, um, be sure that when you respond or when you speak, that you speak into one of the microphones that are on the table. So um, actually before, since people aren't lining up immediately at the mics, let me just at first invite members of the panel to raise questions or comments on each other's presentations. I was particularly interested, Isle, in what you might have to say about Doug's um, discussion of the military, given you know your own somewhat discussion of the Israeli military. I I I, I found it very interesting, and uh, I think that uh, I uh, I like it a lot because I for me it's not another sphere that I am thinking a lot in the context of uh, discussion of marriage, and uh, I was just reading actually what you what you wrote about it recently, Lisa, and I think that. Uh, we can think similar question about the question of marriage. What can you, the politics of the meantime about getting rights that today are connected to marriage in, in, in especially in the US where, where the connection between rights and marriage is maybe stronger than countries where you have like uh, common law marriage or other model, alternative models. So I think that, uh, I mean, of course, the context of Israel is very different because Israel has a, uh, uh, gener generally, of course, compulsory military service. Uh, um, and uh, so it's a bit, but and, um, I think there's a very, I, what I, the reason, I mean, it, <laughs> you asked me, and, I, and it's, I, it's, 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 it's right asking me also because I think part of what I'm, I'm very interesting in, uh, interested to do is to say, what do we, what does it mean to think queerly about those issues? And part of my little bit, uh, uh, in a way, uh, uh, lamenting the death of queer politics is that, and when I said today, a lot of what passes for queer politics is like what one, is the, would be the parallel of radical feminism or cultural feminism, but not this uh, queer as in critical theory that engages with you know this institution and the many meanings it may have, mm -hmm. and the many meanings that participating in them may may create. So, and I think that uh, when it comes to the military in the Israeli context, it's 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 a very uh, if we want to compare it, it's very tricky because. Uh, it's uh, in 1993 when uh, there was uh, this issue came on the political agenda. 
it was supposedly a very, very smart thing in the sense that it was kind of a ticket to citizenship, On the other, in, which in Israel is very much a mark of citizenship. On the other hand, it was exactly, it's a question of at what price and at whose price, because like Palestinians who are citizens of Israel, for example, do not serve in the military, and that's considered as part of, uh, not that they would want to, but that's considered part of supposedly excuses to discriminate them, and so you participate in that. So I think, uh, but on the other hand, you know, you gain something, but you lose, and then the question, who gains and who loses? So I think we really have in marriage, military, all those questions, to disentangle those questions, rather than just say, oh, we have an answer, marriage is bad because that's heteronormative and that's replicating. I mean, that's like, you know, with this, uh, oh, military is bad, that's with disregard, you know, what specific uh, material benefits or maybe symbolic will some people will get, and then we have to ask, you know, but at what, whose price, at what price? So I think so, so uh, definitely uh, like that very much. Do we have uh, comments or questions from folks in the audience? Um, I'll try one. I guess um, I'm hearing some of that and the comparison between the mar marriage and the military um, and I understand there's obviously there's a poverty draft and that's kind of part of what you're talking about in some ways with working class people seeking benefits in the army. And um, I'm coming from the University of Arizona where a lot of my students are um, in the, actually in ROTC or going into the military or coming out. So I understand the kinds of services that you're talking about providing access, right, for folks in the military to come um, to be able to have access to. But I guess one thing that I feel like is, is missing is um, a discussion of the impact of the military um, through violence on the rest of the world and, um, and how that affects soldiers and also how that affects their victims or the victims of the US military. And I guess what I wanted to suggest is that maybe another thing that soldiers might need access to is the kinds of education and discourse that help people to refuse that. Um, and so I just wanted to know if, if you would be willing to expand on that a little bit or maybe trouble that parallel between marriage and military. Okay, well, is it? Oh, yeah, that's on. Um, sure. I mean, I guess I specifically didn't talk about marriage because I think it is more fraught and less clear cut. Like, marriage does provide certain material benefits, but a lot of those material benefits are more strongly directed toward the middle class, um, right? So, tax breaks, that kind of thing, the like non marriage penalty that everyone. Uh, talks about. Um, so that's the first thing. I guess I didn't talk as much about the effects of violence on people outside of the United States because I think that that is the work, like that's work that's largely been done. Like this is a lot of the criticisms of military service and the, the effects or the emphasis on don't ask, don't tell have been largely about like, oh, gay people trying to be the friendlier face of US imperialism abroad. Um, and so what I wanted to think about was, um, okay, well, that's like, that's really important to think about, but we also need to think about like who it is that we're actually getting to, to be that friendlier face. Um, and it, this, the idea of this poverty draft, and, and I think the, the immigrant draft, too, is an important way to think about it. And um, yeah, I think your point about, I really take your point to heart, too, about the effects of being an agent of violence upon um, peoples elsewhere in the world, especially for um, people who are uh, immigrants and required to sort of engage in like lateral acts of racism against people elsewhere in the world. Um, and so like that kind of psychic toll, but I think that that's part of like something that we, um, when we do our queer theorizing and queer politics actually need to take on ourselves, like advocating for greater mental health services for uh, former service members, for things like, I don't know how many people in here knew that, uh, that like therapist client privilege doesn't actually extend to members of the military. Um, like, that's something, right, like, so people who actually want to pursue that kind of treatment um, often don't have that open to them in the same kind of protected way that we do. Um, so the access to those kinds of resources just isn't there, and I think that's maybe something that we need to think about doing. Okay, uh, we, ha we have another question, so, okay. Uh, I think it's interesting that most of your presentations have to be do with corporality or embodiment. Um, I'm an older homosexual, so, uh, and I come from the Caribbean in which the presentation of the body due to the fact that we virtually do not wear a lot of clothing uh, or that we have to 
you know, incorporate the kind of clothing that we wear. Um, but I really l love you, uh, uh, Elena Kingsley, uh, because it's really that you see a uh, a woman um, that that is an athlete and that also is uh, given the opportunity of express herself intellectually. Uh, we see them as an object. I'm thinking about my niece that committed suicide a couple of years ago uh, because of her fixation in terms of not being able to do intellectual work. She was an athlete. Um, I just, um, I mean, very interested in what you say because right now we have a problem with the services for veterans. Um, and now that we sort of deal with the known as don't tell, my question would be, would they be accepting gay uh, couples or gay marriages, uh, gay married couples in the army? Or would they allow them to marry when they are in the army and things like that? I think that's um, some questions that we have to, I gather, post. Um, we, the activists, we're trying to deal with it, but um, it's a very difficult issue. Why don't we go ahead to the next okay, comment or question, you. too, before we have a response from the panel. So this is sort of a large question, but well, Lisa Dugan prophetically coined the term homonormativity when it was not obvious to many of us that it was going in that direction before we saw pinkwashing, before we had the term homonationalism. Now, um, a lot of us understand that gay rights leads to a kind of white supremacy or a certain kind of nationalist domination, and we're coming to a time when the gay rights agenda is being won. We're about to see gay marriage in the United States. So I sort of would like to ask all of you, and especially you, what is going to happen now? Once they win their agenda, I mean, do they pack up and go home or, and clear the air for the rest of us, or what, what do you see coming next? Panelists. It's... Well. Once I was in there, some I, I uh, it is, okay. Go ahead. Uh, no, actually, it's very, very short. I, you know, the short answer would be that uh, we don't know what the future. I can't say anything because it didn't happen yet, as right. So, uh, <laughs> but um, uh, I think I just all I want to say because is that I think that well, two very short things. I think that uh, we. Uh, I think that. To think that gay rights are won, uh, it goes a bit to some of what I said. So, you know, you can have same-sex marriage and you can have gays in the military, all sort of things, and we can talk about who benefits from it. I'm not sure that actually marriage necessarily benefits the middle class more than others, but we can argue who does it benefit and in what context, and maybe it varies between countries. But I think that uh, 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 in a way we can think about how right as long as we stay within this division of heterosexual versus homosexual, it's a division entrenched in like uh, in hierarchy. So I don't know, for me next is like again to think of queer politics as in, okay, how do we undo this division, right? Uh, but, uh, but, but many people don't see it that way, right? That like kind of liberal identity politics see that as give, making gay equal to straight based on a certain model rather than looking at this division itself as problematic. So. I'm especially interested in the, the three panelists who haven't spoken. If you, if you have something to say about, you know, from your own research and your own work, what you have to say about what comes next or what the implications for, for politics are of the, of the work that you're doing, you want to sort of draw that out of your, your work? Sure. Yeah. Um, uh, one, of, <clears throat> one of the things that I came uh, to this conference thinking that I that I thought, and that this conference has kind of unpicked for me a bit, is this linear narrative of what happened to the LGBT communities. Um, well, I still struggle with that because, um, I mean, it's quite easy to see, a, uh, like you say, a um, 
a history in that that is quite, in a way, quite linear from, from a radical, from the s Stonewall. We're quite wedded to the idea that Stonewall was real and radical, and then there was a series of co-options, and then we lost something that we had. But obviously, and then, and then the idea of a future also buys into um, that kind of progress narrative that then there will be a future that is even worse than, and I'm not sure about that in general. And I wonder, I mean, my, um, my field is, is around representation and, and um, circulation of knowledge. And I, I just, there's a lot that does happen um, that just doesn't get represented so, and doesn't get circulated. And what gets circulated is only what, can, what, what is legible um, under certain, is legible by certain um, frames and ways of uh, interpreting. So, I don't know whether it does, it's about a future developing or it's about um, uncovering more presence that are already here, but are not the homo nationalist ones. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just trying to critique the idea that there's, there will be a future that is different from the present and that it was different from the past, because I guess um, there's been a lot of ways in which homo nationalism could be dated back from people in, in other talks have quite interestingly pointed out that um, it was happening already in the 70s and in the 80s in relation to, for example, Latin America and the, uh, the relationship between ILGA and Latin America. So just trying to say something about that. Any, anyone else want to respond to Sarah's question? Um, well, I also, I, I have no idea what's going to happen next. <laughs> and maybe there is still a slight chance that they won't win. <laughs> but um, there are two things. It's, first of all, it's, it's very different in a European context. I think queer studies, queer theory has not yet really arrived there. So um, I hope that there is still a lot of work that can be done. Um, and also, I think that there's a lot of queer intersectional work that's still, that's still out there that um, like queerness can still benefit from a lot of other radical politics, other social action stuff that hasn't been really incorporated into queer activism or the queer movement. So I, I don't know, I hope I'll see that still going on. Did you want to comment? Thank you for asking a very poignant uh, question about miniaturizations and the impact of U.S. miniaturization. Pull the mic a little closer. Um, exactly. In the theorizations of homonationalism, and when the relationship between homonormativity and U.S. Imperial, imperialism, miniaturization is a very important component of analysis. So I admit that in my presentation, I, I didn't talk about the miniaturization in Malaysia, in relation to the U.S. militarization, there's a lot going on, especially with the former, just former uh, Prime Minister of Malaysia. And the other thing that is very important as well is a lot of tensions in East Asia and how now militarization in Southeast Asia also, you know, there's a tri triangular relationship between U.S. imperialism, Southeast Asia, Miniaturization and the East Asia, assisting East Asia tensions. And related to the question of um, Sarah Schutman have asked, yes, currently is a very interesting transitional period for the United States and see how homonormativity will go with the change of the don't ask, don't tell policy, as well as the recognition of gay rights in Maryland uh, and Washington, D.C. So, um, but however, because I'm not a futuristic kind of theorist, I'm more anthropological, historical. So maybe in a few years' time, maybe I will talk about it. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so this means I get the last word here. Of course, Sarah, that is the question, right, um, that we all are living with right now. And, and, and uh, it, it is the $64,000 question. And I think on the one hand, we do have a lot of examples 
um, uh, alongside and before us of civil rights establishments and what happened when civil rights establishments became uh, achieved certain levels of success. The, the uh, um, black civil rights establishment in the United States achieving formal legal equality, a, board v, a Brown v. Board of Education, um, the, uh, the 1964 civil rights law, and in the wake of that, the material conditions of everyday life for most black people worsened, right? So we have that kind of example. We have the example of, say, the South African uh, Constitution, right? A moment of enormous victory um, on so many fronts for so many people of ending discrimination, including sexual orientation discrimination, in the South African Constitution. And in the wake of that, the conditions of life for ordinary, the vast majority of ordinary people have worsened. Right, so the paradox that is, and it, 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 it comes to us now, uh, those of us who've involved, been involved in LGBTQ politics, that as the gay civil rights establishment achieves its agenda, we actually live at a moment when the immaterial conditions of life for most queers are really not so great, right? And I hear I'm talking about the United States, but globally, you know, this, things vary globally. But um, uh, it, it, it's, um, so we live in this paradox of, right, this sort of, the achievement of a certain kind of equality which does not translate into uh, better conditions of life. Um, and so I think we have all of us who are interested in, in economic ju and social and political justice and cultural justice have that, have that paradox to grapple with. And I think that um, what we're all in various ways gesturing towards is a multi-issue social justice movement in which a queer perspective is a strong animating principle. Um, but that single issue, I think we've seen this, the fate of single issue equality politics, and it's been a disaster. Even in the face of ultimate victory, it's a disaster. Um, and so, uh, you know, the last, the last comment I would make, though, um, is um, about the, the last paper, because I, I, the struggle to compare, to look at the, you know, re reform politics and relationship to more radical transformational agendas, we all also deal with that problem in our everyday political lives. But I think that um, the example of the military, um, that it's, uh, trans politics and marriage are not good analogies, because uh, those are contexts wherein one engages with the state, one gets limited results, um, but it's, uh, uh, you know, uh, one participates in a politics that doesn't necessarily produce the redistributions one wants. But in the case of the military, you're actually carrying out the murderous agenda of, of, of imperial states um, and are yourself being damaged psychically and physically in the process. I think the better analogy is prison, is dealing with prisons, because prisons also conscript poor people <laughs> and people of color more than others. And uh, we want to improve conditions in prisons, but ultimately we want to abolish prisons, right? So I think that's really a better analogy um, for the military. The military is more like the prison than it is like the situation of transgender reform or the situation of marriage in, in relationship to household and partnership recognition. But um, so that's my speechette, and we need to clear out so the next uh, panel can Hopefully. occupy the premises. Thank you all for coming. Thank you very much.